is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your strength, with all your heart, sorry, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Um, you shall teach them. Diligently to them when you sit in your house on your hand, and they will be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doors of your house and on your gates. Um, so we see a very important instruction that the Lord is uh, giving the children of Israel uh, and uh, saying, okay, one thing, the first thing is about. The Lord Himself, a description of who He is. Um, here, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And uh, how we, need to, second one is how we need to relate to Him. You know? um, it's, you know, it's not a ritual, it's not a tradition, uh, but you shall love the Lord your God. You know, it's a loving relationship, it's a living relationship with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Right? And, um, and then it gives an instruction for for the parents um, towards their children, what they need to do. Um, it says here, um, first of all, this command should be in your heart. You love the Lord. And then it says, you shall teach them diligently, your children. Okay, so teaching them about God, teaching them, teaching children, is first and foremost, primary responsibility of parents. You know, that's what we see. We should teach them. And then he also says, you should talk of them. Okay, so teaching is probably in a very formal setting. Maybe we are saying, okay, come, let's sit down. Let's, uh, I just want to teach you something uh, about God, what he has done. It's, it's a little bit formal, right? But he also says, and you shall talk of them. And he talks about where scenarios where you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. So, talks about various uh, scenarios, informal settings, um, where you have, uh, they're saying, okay, uh, let, let's just have a chat. We're just having coffee, we're just having a, uh, maybe breakfast, and uh, we're just sitting down, and uh, let's have a chat. Okay, so you should talk of them, talk about God. So it's not, you know, you don't really change your tone of voice and you're not preaching, but you should, you are talking of God. It's a very normal, very real, very authentic thing. So what happens is that children also begin to understand that, hey, um, uh, just a minute. So God is not relegated to a, a particular day. It's not a, you know, something traditional, something ritualistic, but it's as real. Our relationship with them is so real, as normal as breathing, as normal as sitting down, as normal as taking a walk, as normal as lying down, as rising up. And it is part of our everyday life, right? So, um, so we see this very important instruction. This is how you relate to God. You relate to God. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And you teach diligently to your children. It's a responsibility of parents. But you should also talk of them so the parents, children know that you know, this is how I can relate to God. I can have conversations about God, about the reality of God, about uh, you know how God, what God means to uh, my parents and uh, uh, how God has dealt with them. You know, if you read the rest of the chapter, and especially verse 20, it, it asks about you know, when your son asks these questions, you know, uh, what are these teachings, what are these um, commandments, then you shall answer. And, you, and, and the answer is that, OK, this is what God did for us. Um, so in our day and time, you can testify about this is how God dealt with me. This is how God led me. Uh, this is how I came to know God. Right, so, um, so it's very real, very authentic, and it's in a family setting. Right, so let's let's pray, and uh, if there's something that we can ask God, we can ask God. Say, Lord, uh, I want my relationship with you to be real. I want it to be as normal as uh, as breathing, as uh, as as frequent as eating, as free, as normal and frequent as everyday life. Right? I want my relationship with you to be uh, to be like that, and. Uh, 
and so that it can just flow out in normal conversation in day-to-day -day things it can just flow out and i can testify a few right okay let's pray father we thank you lord we thank you for this day we thank you that you're so real to each one of us we thank you that you teach us in normal everyday settings lord we thank you god that you have um, you have drawn us, invited us, Lord, uh, into this relationship with you, God. And it's a, it's a relationship of love. It's a relationship of uh, Lord, holiness and purity and righteousness, God. And Lord, enable us, Lord, to love you with all our heart, with all our strength, with everything within us, with all our soul, oh God. I pray, Father God, this morning that if there's anything that is hindering us from loving you in this manner, Lord, to obey your commandments is to love you, Lord. If you said, oh God, if you love me, obey my commandments. And so, God, if there's anything that is hindering us, Lord, I pray that it'll be, uh, it'll be broken. Lord, I pray that if there's anything that we have set up, Lord, and unknowingly, unknowingly, that is stopping us from loving you in this manner, I pray that we will set, us, set it aside and put it away, God, and repent and, and begin to follow you. And Lord, we thank you for those of us who are parents. We, we, we thank you for these instructions that we will, Lord, teach diligently, Lord, and we will not shirk from this responsibility, God, as parents, that we will teach diligently and we will also talk of what you have done, talk of who you are to us, Lord, in all these everyday settings, routine settings. We just want to thank you for these instructions. We, we come at these uh, today's sessions, these classes into your mighty hands. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Right. So hope everybody's doing fine. I, I saw... Um, uh, Okay, okay, that's for the biblical preaching class. I saw the uh, what you uploaded on the chat on the uh, on the classroom classwork section. So I've, I saw that. Maybe we'll talk about that in the third hour. Um, okay, so uh, in uh, marriage and family, we've been uh, we've been studying about uh, we, we're in the fourth chapter, right? We're in the fourth chapter about understanding roles. It's very important that. Uh, husband understands his role the wife understands her role and it will make for to have clarity in this will really help the process of becoming one right will really help the marriage will really uh, smoothen out a lot of differences right? uh, will really um, also bring uh, our expectations will make it real authentic right and it's uh, it, it won't be an unreal expectation and also our expectation will be founded on scripture, founded on the truth to say that hey, this is what God has put down as the uh, as a role of the husband. So our, my expectation would be that as a spouse, you fulfill that role. right? And how can I help you fulfill that role? So um, it's important for us uh, to understand that role. Right? OK, um, Sirkeni, I see a uh, prayer request. OK, fine. So, um, so this is uh, something that we need to um, um, understand, right? So we, we looked at the husband's role last class. We looked at the husband's role, and I think we, we went midway, right? And uh, to look at this, we were looking at uh, Ephesians chapter 5, which uh, very beautifully and also very uh, in a detailed manner, descriptively, um, um, charts down, you know, lists down what is the role of the husband. Okay, so um, so it talks about how one needs to relate as husband and and wife. How need to how they need to relate to each other. So let's um, let's just do a quick recap. You know, we we saw that um, uh, before that. I'll read that uh, passage, Ephesians five, and um, yeah, verse twenty one onwards. Okay. Um, submitting to one another in the fear of God. And before that, you know, it says, be filled with the Spirit, um, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, etc. And it says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Okay, verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ, uh, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as Christ is subject to um, the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. 
that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Okay, So from 21 onwards till the end of the chapter, we see this beautiful representation or this analogy of Christ and the church, the body, and he's relating that to the husband and the wife. So we see that the husband has to love. Okay, we'll, we'll come to the role of the wife a little later. So you see that the husband has to love the wife. And the word used there is agape. Right? Husband loves the wife as Christ loves the church. So it's a unconditional love. It's a sacrificial love. It's a, it, it's a, it's a love that demands a lot out of us who are going to be loving our wives, right? So there's, uh, it's a love that builds up and enriches the wife. Okay. And he uses another word, says, uh, we need to, husbands need to nourish the wife. Okay. So we see that in um, uh, verse 29, for no one hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. So in relating to the wife, the husband has to nourish the wife, meaning nurture. Right? So not only provide for physical needs uh, as part of the responsibility, but also provide for the emotional needs, provide for the spiritual needs. Right? So um, be encouraging. Uh, um, and be, uh, be um, uh, spiritually also to guide, to uh, to motivate, to enable the wife to grow, to empower the wife to grow. Okay, so so it's not a, it's not a constant uh, you know instruction saying you do this, you do this, you do this, but it's it's to nurture, and right? it's to nurture, it's to encourage. So uh, for those of us who are married, it's. Uh, it's it's something you know it's it's, it's another checklist for us to um, to really reflect upon and see you know am i doing that right because what happens is in the course of marriage you know when uh when you know maybe just a year into it two years three years whatever you know and then uh, you know your spouse is your wife is very familiar right to you and then uh what what is familiar we we don't normally you know maybe over the period of years, we don't not cherish or we don't nourish, right? But we see that as a uh, as a responsibility, as a role of the husband. Right? So, if, if for a single person to understand that, okay, this is also part of the package. Right? When it comes to marriage, um, just that it's not that I just get married and then things just happen. No, but this is expected of me to nourish my wife. It is expected of me to take care of her emotional needs. You know, maybe she's discouraged, maybe she's fearful, or maybe she lacks something emotionally. Uh, how do I, you know, how do I point her to Christ? Right? Maybe spiritually, uh, to be that teacher, to be the head, and to guide. Um, so that's a responsibility as well. Right. So we see nourishment. Then we we see cherishing. So we saw the cherishes to treat something as precious to consider something as precious right so um so does or do i as a husband do i cherish do i treat her as something precious or do i uh, treat her as something that is common or worthless how do i do that you know with my words right so when we when i communicate as a, when the husband communicates respectfully to the wife the wife feels cherished 
feels worth right um, um, feels valued so how is my communication as a husband um a wife feels valued and cherished when there is romance and not just physical intimacy not just sex right so that that is also very important you know so how do you treat the wife so um, you know find out you know we at the end of this chapter we're going to find out um, uh, uh, something about uh, you know communication and also about um, language uh, some of you may be aware of it just going to look at that and that will actually help us to communicate in a in a manner um, and and also you know to communicate um, with concern to communicate respectfully and communicate in a manner that the wife understands right uh, and also vice versa right so so there is romance when the husband is trustworthy okay so which means when the husband acts behaves uh, in a way that the husband the wife can trust right well if the husband acts very suspiciously right say okay um, well i'm going to uh, uh, for example you know the husband comes home late after work uh, the work got over at let's say six o'clock in the evening the husband comes home at comes home at uh, 10 10 p.m and the wife asks you know where were you and the husband says that's none of your business <laughs> right so the husband the wife is unable to trust the husband first of all the communication is uh, very harsh and rude and secondly it's it's not open you're not being transparent and now the wife feels okay what was he up to right for us after work what was he up to what did he do is he seeing someone else is he you know all those questions all those suspicions right so um can the wife trust her husband so if the uh, husband is trustworthy which means you know your behavior, your speech, and everything is above reproach, and uh, the wife is able to trust fully the husband. Then the wife feels valued, feels cherished. Right? Then, uh, uh, wife also feels cherished when there is um, sharing of responsibilities, so that her burden is is made easier. If the wife carries responsibilities the husband carries responsibilities so when the husband reaches out to say okay let me let me take care of this so that you know you you can rest or you can uh you can you know uh, you can maybe probably go out and meet with your friends and and do such things and you know, let me let me just take care of this today uh let me take care of what what needs to be done today maybe in the house maybe something else right so when that is done then the wife feels cherished. The wife feels valued. Okay. Uh, now these are just uh, you know just few examples, right? Um, but I'm sure that there's there's a lot more, and it can be specific to that particular person, right? Um, a wife feels cherished when the husband sets a godly example in the pursuit of God, right? A godly example, a life that is pursuing God, a life that is passionate about God. Um, then the wife feels cherish now you might you might say how does that happen you know? so you know that okay a husband is pursuing god husband is going after righteousness after holiness then the wife feels secure wife feels uh, also you know that uh, yes this is the right direction you know the husband is taking you know if the husband is not pursuing god let's say distancing himself from god then you know that something is wrong okay the husband could potentially open his life for temptation, potentially open his life for, you know, to make wrong choices, wrong decisions, um, and all that could happen, open the door for the enemy to walk in, right? So, so the wife feels valued. Okay, so maybe we never thought of it that way, you know, in my pursuit of God, you know, how will that affect our relationship? We see that, you know, our lack of pursuit of God affects all relationships 
all our relationships you know it, it affects our relationship at work it affects our friendships it affects our you know relationship with family members when we distance ourselves from god because we are uh, we are designed to receive life from him right we are desi designed to be in that um, uh, connection with him so when we when we do not um, you know, when we distance ourselves, then obviously, you know, like the Lord Jesus says, you know, it withers, the branch withers and dies, right? Okay, uh, so the, the husband is also called to lead, okay? Okay, um, so that's, uh, that's one thing, okay, to lead. Now, when it comes to leading, when it comes to leadership, now there could be, you know, various ways of defining, right, uh, leadership, you know different methods, different ways by which people lead, autocratic, dictatorial leadership. Um, so here we see that it's leadership the way Christ led. So when it comes to leading also, it comes from this place of loving uh, as Christ loved the church. So it's a loving leadership. Okay. Um, some things for us to understand. Okay. When we say, okay, the husband is called to lead, or the husband is the head, okay. we see that it's a divine order, divine placement. It's never on superior abilities, because it's very clear. We see that we are co-heirs, right? We are co-heirs, which means that we are equal in the sight of God. So it is not based on, you know, one is superior, one is inferior. But in God's eyes, we are equal. We are valued equally. We are, sure, we are valued by Him equally. So uh, there's no partiality. Right? So we need to understand that. Okay. So what does it mean when it comes to okay, the husband is the head of the house? That means that God has designed according to the role, according to the responsibility. God has, um, you know, divinely placed us as husbands in this place of headship. And the leadership is not something dictatorial, meaning, okay, you have to listen no matter what. I am the head of the house, uh, so you better listen. Everybody shape up, everybody listen, you know, everybody better obey. No, it's not that. Because it says, you know, in that uh, at the beginning of the chapter, be submitted to one another. Okay, so be filled with the spirit, submitting to one another. In the fear of God, right? That's what it says, right? Submitting to one another in the fear of God. So um, you have God's, you know, you pursue God, you seek God, you reverentially have the fear of God, and you submit to one another out of that. So this, we see this headship or this leadership is based on divine order or divine design. Okay? When we understand that, then it brings a lot of clarity. You know, we, we don't mind. Uh, you know, the wife does not mind yielding to that headship, yielding to that leadership. Okay? It is how God designed. It's not to abuse. It's not to treat one disrespectfully. It's not to put one, you know, firmly in that place. It's not to use one as a doormat, right? but it's a loving leadership. Okay, right. So this leadership is based on Christ's example. Uh, this leadership involves taking responsibility, which means you know it's it's uh, leadership is is responsibility, right? It's not being irresponsible. It is, it is, uh, you know, it is. Uh, what are some responsibility? Meeting family family's needs, maybe financial needs, maybe to make decisions, maybe to be two steps ahead, right? Um, so it involves responsibility. Um, the husband is also called to be a loving leader. We, we looked at that. So the thing is, when it when it comes to leadership, right, we need to earn uh, the right to be to lead. We need to earn the right to be heard okay, as leaders you know, in in any in any situation, right? Like even in uh, typical, you know, uh, wherever even if uh, for us a title of leadership is given, and then we are we are leading. Even in such scenarios, you know, people will okay respect the title. You know, if it's an official setting, if it's a uh, you know a work setting, professional setting, people will. But then, over a period of time, they will lose respect if we if we do not earn the right to lead them. 
right? And that comes by competence, that comes by, you know, all the other things that have been leading, I mean, studying about leadership, um, comes out of compassion, etc. cetera. So uh, a loving leadership. So we need to be able to earn the right to lead, okay? Then the other thing is that um, we know that the husband is, is not perfect, okay? The husband is, has the potential to make mistakes, has the potential to maybe misjudge certain things. So to be a leader, uh, when we say the husband is a leader, the husband is the head of the house, does not mean that the husband is always right. Okay, the husband could make mistakes. But um, the husband needs to, maybe you know, in areas where he, he feels he's wrong, maybe to accept that. Right? Maybe in areas where he feels that, okay, he does not have the expertise to take help. Maybe the, the wife is you know, uh, competent in certain areas to take help, to take that counsel. So uh, so when we say leader, it does not mean that the husband knows everything, his husband is always right. Uh, we don't, no, we're not saying that. So we understand that God has created, God designed marriage to be this, this way. And uh, this leadership as one of the roles, uh, one of the responsibilities of the husband. Okay, then to know the wife, Okay, then let's say, okay, of course I know everything about but about the other person, but do you truly know, right? Um, what is what is her strength? What is her weakness? What are her likes? What are her dislikes? Right? To know her, what are her fears, right? Um, well, during the courtship days, there's a lot of communication and you're trying to find out, okay, what is it that you like? And you're doing things that, you know, buying things that she likes and, okay, oh, oh, Okay, this uh, maroon is the color that you like. Okay, let me get something in maroon. You know, during the courtship days, all that happens, but you know, during the course of the marriage as well, getting to know um, your spouse or getting to know your wife specifically is very important, right? Um, no, so that uh, that is also something that we need to, as husbands, there's a, a responsibility. Okay, then honor, honor respect and celebrate uh, who she is, right? All the gifts and everything, the grace that she carries, the anointing that she has. You know, have you looked at it that way? Okay. How, what has God anointed her to be? What has God graced her to be? What has God gifted her, right? And, uh, and to really celebrate that, to honor that, uh, saying, God, you know, you are working in her. The way you dwell in me, you dwell in her. And to honor the gifting, honor the release of the uh, the wisdom, God's wisdom that she carries, right? To celebrate that. Okay. So these are some things uh, that we see as uh, when we when we consider the role of the husband. So you see that it is uh, it is something for us to understand. You know, if we are single, it's something for us to really study and see. Okay, you know, how can I do this? Right? Uh, or and and to you know, uh, renew our mind to the truth that, uh, to the fact that, okay, this is something that I need to do intentionally, okay? Um, it is not something that happens by chance, right? It is something that I need to, when I consider marriage, when I want, you know, if I'm considering marriage, um, then I need to be equipped. I need to think about these things, okay? So you see how preparing for marriage is uh, important. Because uh, we may not consider all this. We may have a very romantic view of uh, marriage and say, okay, it'll all you know, it'll be fine as long as I'm you know, with this person all the time. But you know that it, it is not so, right? Uh, because we can live under the same roof and yet be very distant uh, from the from our spouse. Right? So um, for those of us who are single, we need to you know, consider this seriously. For those of us who are married, this is, these are areas for us to grow in. Right. Okay, let's look at the wife's responsibility and the wife's role. Okay, here we see um, again in the same chapter we see that uh, wives are called to love, to respect, and the word that is used there, uh, you know, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, and uh, uh, and so on. So we see here that the word that is used for love. And, uh, uh, you know, in Titus chapter 2, verse 4, and Genesis 2, 20, um, uh, the idea 
you know, uh, in Genesis 2.20 is the of the companion. And Titus 2.24, the word used is phileo. The word used for love is phileo, which means a friend, to be a best friend, to be a companion. Okay, so, so the wife has to, you know, or the wife to be needs to, needs to understand that. Okay, I'm going to be, or uh, I'm going to, you know, see you. You cannot just become a best friend just like that, right? It takes time. So I'm going to do whatever it takes to be my husband's, or husband to be his best friend, or companion, uh, a helpmate, right? Um, which means that um, I need to. As long as okay, he is submitted to God. He is, you know, doing his bit. Uh, I need to understand that he is also a work in progress, right? He is also a work in progress, just as I am. Um, so the wife needs to understand, or the wife to be needs to understand that he is a work in progress. Therefore, I'm going to accept him. So when we say work in progress, that means there is some progress happening, like intentionally. He's looking at, uh, you know, he's progressing. Like he's also doing something. He's approaching God. He's seeking to change. Right. So he's a work in progress. There's some, there's a movement there. There's a momentum there. And wife to be says, okay, I'm going to accept him as he is. Okay. These are some rough edges. Right. These are some uh, areas that I see that uh, hey, these need to be turned into strengths. He's not there yet. Okay. Now I'm going to accept him as he is. Okay. Now, here I just want to pause and uh, talk about, you know, what we uh, just remind us about what we looked at when we were considering uh, the compatibility. You know, in that chapter, when it comes to preparing, you know, we looked at compatibility and we said that there's some some things are non-negotiable. Right? It's spiritual compatibility. Uh, emotional compatibility. We are considering a lot of things, and then we we are also asking a few, few questions. You know, when it comes to, um, you know, is he able to provide? Is he is does he have a relationship with God? Is he a believer? And all those questions are non-negotiables. Like the answers to those things, we are. We are so when we are saying that I'm going to accept him as he is, right? We are not talking about that. So we are. So now those are foundational. Those are given. Right? So when we're saying, okay, I'm going to accept him as he is with his imperfection. Okay, you're saying that okay, he is a child of God. He is, uh, you know, in all these areas, he is. Uh, uh, there, there is a foundation. Right? We are compatible, and at the same time, I see that he's not a perfect person. He's a suitable person because he's compatible, but he's not the perfect person. Uh, he's the right person. But he's not the perfect one. You know? There's a difference, right? So the suitable one or the right one need not be the perfect one. Where he is a work, work in progress. So, so he's a work in progress. So I'm going to accept him as he is, right? Okay. Then um, uh, it's it's also you know as a as a wife, I'm going to love. So love means again. Just like the husband loves, it's sacrificial action. It's not just saying in words, or it's not just you know saying uh, you know so many times I love you, I love you, I love you. But it's also action. Uh, love is a verb; it needs to be demonstrated, and uh, it, it it would involve uh, sacrifice. Right? It's sacrificial action. Uh, it's dem de demonstrated through our focus, availability, willingness, etc. Love is also physical willingness in the sense, um, you know, when it comes to physical intimacy, uh, you know, it's also an expression of love. Okay? So both the husband and the wife, or the husband to be and the wife to be, need to understand that it's an expression of love. Uh, it's, it's an expression of. Uh, we're going to, you know, study that, of course, in a separate chapter. But it's an expression of love, and God designed it. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, uh, and, and so on, right? Okay, so submitting. So loving the husband is one, um, uh, is, is, uh, and submitting is another. So here we, we also saw, you know, submission is, is something that is, again, a divine order, a divine design. Because the husband is, a, 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 God is placed as the leader, as the head, so therefore, it requires, you know, um, the wife 
to be submitted. At the same time, we also see that you know you sub be submitted to one another, right? Uh, in the fear of God. Okay, so submission is not a bad word. Okay, it's not a bad word. It's not uh, you know because a lot of people say I will never you know uh, why should I submit to another person as long as we are equal. What is the question of submission? Or where is the question of submission? We are equal, right? But the fact is this, that the submission of the wife demonstrates love, demonstrates support, and also demonstrates that, okay, I, I recognize and I acknowledge that God has appointed you, you know, as a leader, as the head of the house. I I acknowledge that. Right? Um, so you not only are you honoring God by doing that, but you're also uh, demonstrating support. I mean, it gives the, uh, the husband a lot of confidence to say that, to to uh, to know that my wife is actually supporting me in this, and she demonstrates her su support by being submitted. Okay, um, so being husband submitted uh, means a lot of things it means i'm not competing with my husband for the position of leadership it means that i'm obedient to god it means that i'm actually releasing you know freeing my husband to take his appointed role his appointed place in marriage so imagine you know um, th this is actually causing the marriage to thrive and flourish okay so as long as uh, wives understand no, 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 no. The big thing is this: uh, that the husband loves the uh, wife as Christ loved the church, and out of that loving leadership, right, in response to that loving leadership, the wife yields in submission. So you see the beautiful picture, right? It's not the husband demanding submission. It's not that the husband, you know, out of force, uh, making the wife submit. But it's from a place of loving leadership, right? from a place where God has designed, and and from that place, as the husband carries out his role, God appointed role, as a leader in loving leadership, then it becomes a natural thing for the wife to submit, to be yielded to this design. Right, so we see that. So it's being obedient. It's freeing. It's 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 also empowering the husband to lead. Okay, so we all we see that it empowers the husband. It it boosts the confidence of the husband. It empowers the husband um, to lead. Okay, to maybe the husband. You know, he was just saying that. Okay, uh, wife is constantly saying, oh, he's not leading in all spiritual matter. He's not uh, you know taking decisions. Uh, but uh, maybe that is so. But also we need to check and see. Now, am I empowering him to do that? Am I empowering him, or you know, do I make fun uh, because of my competence? Because I'm better at certain things, do I constantly put him down, right? Um, or do I constantly challenge him, challenge his leadership? All that you know, we need to look and see. The wife needs to look and uh, reflect and see. You know. Am I actually freeing him to be God, to be whom God has called him to be as a husband, right? So, so this submission means all this, but submission does not mean that one is inferior. I think that is the greatest fear, right? A, a person might have uh, to submit or to surrender, right? Saying, oh, I, how can I do that, right? Or maybe that person has grown up in a place where there was constant conflict and there was constant put down and the person had to really, the, 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 the woman, you know, the girl had to really, um, to really rise up and uh, rebel and to make her voice to be heard, right? In that kind of a, you know, maybe, a, maybe she grew up in that. So for her, any kind of, you know, submitting to leadership is a problem because she's been wounded, she's been hurt, and she had to really um, fight and struggle to be heard 
to be respected. She had to do these things. So she learns a very uh, you know, unwritten lesson saying, okay, I need to be this, I need to be rude, I need to put down, uh, you know, especially if it's a man, I need to put him in place, only then I will get respect. So if a person comes from that background, right, and with that understanding, now she is going to be, uh, it's going to be difficult. But the moment the person understands, this is actually what God's design is. This is his intention, right? It is. It does not mean that I'm inferior. It does not mean that I'm, you know, I, I don't have qualities. I don't possess skills. It it never means that, right? So when when a person understands that, then it frees that person to submit willingly. Right? It does not mean that I need to compromise on my individuality or lose my identity now god we know that god has created each one of us unique each one of us uh, you know uh, beautifully uh, wonderfully he has created us we, we and he has given us our identity our identity you know in in our relationship with christ our identity is strong uh, we have certain unique uh, personalities and uh, and god respects that values that just because you become a believer, you know, it doesn't mean that you you lose your sense of identity. You so you lose your, you know, your identity is actually becomes one with Christ. But you see that in in that also, your you know, God respects your individuality, right? Your likes, your dislikes, everything, you know, and your expression, your creativity, and all that. You know, it's never lost. Right? So in when we say I'm submitted, we're not saying that. My individuality is not there anymore. My identity is not there anymore. Right. Um, also, submission does not mean that it's blind obedience. Well, the husband is always right. No, it doesn't mean that. That it uh, it it does not mean that I can be a doormat. I can be just used like an object. No, right? it does not mean that. So now, now you see that submission uh, in the light of all this, right? We see that submission is a beautiful thing. It's not a problem, right? In the light of this, well, will the husband make mistakes? Yes. Will the wife make mistakes? Yes. Right. Uh, and that is why we need to grow in our understanding of our role, and uh, and really take that up and say, okay, God, you know, as part of our Christ likeness, this is also one such thing that we say that, yes, Lord, uh, I need to change to be this to be the best husband that I can be, to be the best wife I can be. And I need to prepare. I need to let your word, let the truth of your word, renew my thinking. Or I need to renew my think thoughts to the truth of your word. Now, society is saying something. You know, my family is saying something. Now, this is how a husband should be. Or, you, know, now, and I, you know, recently, I just had the conversation, and um, the wife was saying that the husband is doing something which is terribly wrong. And the wife is saying that, you know, you know, my family is saying this. Uh, men will be like this. I just need to adjust and go. Men will be like this, and and you know, it's a question of it's a it's a thing of matter of abuse. So, uh, men will be like this. We need we just need to adjust and go. No, right? Um, this is how God wants marriage to be. This is how He has designed it to be. So. So there's no question of saying that, okay, I will be used like a doormat, I will be used like an object, and then, you know, um, and, uh, and be considered worthless or, no, it's not that. God, that is never God's idea. And that is never God's design. So um, submission is not that, right? So when you look at the other, uh, other thing, which is respecting the husband, then we see that it flows automatically. It says, uh, I think we see it in Ephesians, right? Wives, respect your husband. So um, uh, submit to your husband as to the Lord. And also uh, uh, in verse 33, uh, let the wife see that she respects her husband. Okay, So respect is something that is due. Uh, something it means to, to say, I honor you. I appreciate you. Um, you know, appreciate the challenges the husband faces, appreciate uh, or, you know, recognize it, you know, acknowledge, yes, you know, you uh, maybe at work, the husband is really doing his best, you know, appreciate, right? honor that um, and uh, 
appreciate his uniqueness don't keep comparing okay that person is like this that person is no, appreciate the uniqueness um, of this uh, person um, god, whom god has brought to be a husband so appreciate the uniqueness right and all and also help by assisting supporting encouraging okay so we see that um, in genesis 2 2 verse 20 that uh, God says, I will create someone to be the helpmeet, who is suitable, who will be a companion, who will be the helpmeet. Right? So that's, uh, that's God's intent um, for, um, uh, for, for you know, why he created you. Okay, let's look at that, Genesis 2. Verse 20. So um, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Okay? So there was a need. 220 and then god creates and the lord god he took closed up and he made into a woman and he brought her to the man okay so we see that uh, okay so this particular need of companionship of uh, help meet is is a big thing okay so so when the wife says okay uh, can i assist can i help uh, you're actually fulfilling a big role in marriage as a wife. So it's not something demeaning. It's not something that, uh, uh, something that is, uh, well, uh, in, uh, you're saying that I'm, I'm inferior, therefore I need to do it. No. As long as the wife understands, you know, I'm, this is the original design and intent, and I'm actually fulfilling that role. So the wife also feels fulfilled. Well, that's the beauty of thing. Beautiful thing, right? The wife also feels fulfilled, and the husband is liberated uh, to do what he needs to do. Okay, so um, you know, the, of course, you know, if you are preparing for marriage, there are these um, there are these exercises that you can do, or um, if you are in, uh, if you are married, then you can actually, as a wife, as a husband, you know, you can take some time to to actually list down, think, list down, you know, how can I love my wife? How can I nourish my wife? Um, how can I cherish my wife? So it's it's it'll be a very good exercise, and uh, and maybe you know you can attend a marriage seminar, and that'll be a and a good thing as well. It can be really enrich your marriage. Okay, okay. So we'll stop here, and then we'll come back um, and we'll look at some real life examples. Uh, in order to talk about submission and then continue that, okay, right. take a 10 minute break.